this very important gathering. Uh, for us, uh, for Rwanda, and um, actually generally, we can say that uh, there is a very uh, live nexus between governance and economic development. Uh, in the political thinking of our country, we thought to, that uh, as a post-conflict ca country aspiring to, to rapidly develop, we had to have a very strong foundation of good governance. In doing so, our first choice went to stabilization and ensuring security, because we look at security uh, as an imperative for, for uh, stability, but also for economic development. Uh, we looked at, uh, <coughs> we looked at uh, uniting the people, we considered uh, uh, democratic governance as an imperative, uh, because we understood that that's without uh, democratic governance, it will be very difficult to have inclusion, to have equity, and it worked. And we therefore consider the very first opportunity of, uh, for investment is our good governance. And without it, uh, you can't have healthy business. That said, as uh, Peter has already mentioned, Entering the field of governance, it, governance is multiple. Different countries have different systems. Uh, different nations are different in setting. So we had to choose, make some choices. Uh, and our choice in governance are, are, are paramount importance. So in our case, the first lesson from Rwanda is uh, our system must be aligned with our realities. And we had to have innovative governance because our problems were different from others' problems. So if you have an issue of uh, ABCD kind, so we had to find solutions that are toiled to, to our, our challenges. So the governance we adopted is a governance for production, is a governance that uh, uh, allowed people to improve their lives, is a, gov a governance that allowed the government <coughs> to include everyone is a governance that actually spurred uh, economic development. So when you look at um, Rwanda, therefore the, the economic opportunities for investment, as of now we can refer to, uh, there are some critical sectors that we, when we look at it, we, they are really destinations for investment. The investment priority number one is definitely energy as uh, Paris also mentioned it, mentioned it. So as of today, we are at 40% of our 2020 aspirations in terms of energy. So that makes that sector critical. And without energy, you can't do much in terms of development. development. The second sector that is at a very good destination for investment is agriculture, especially when you look at agro-processing and agricultural transformation. Uh, 60 to 70% of our population live on agriculture, but our vision is to have um, that, that the agriculture that is transformed, economic transformation based also on agricultural transformation, agro-processing, so that we have added value to agro-products. Agro, agro the third very important sector for investment is <coughs> construction and real estates. As of today, Rwanda has um, embraced uh, the approach of uh, creating or developing next, next cities to Chigari. Next cities next to Chigari, there are about six in different mm -hmm. regions. And those ones, um, they are, we assume they will absorb an investment of billions of dollars if, because we, we, we are looking at it that uh, as centers of transformation, of economic transformation, that centers that will, will actually help us to also be more distributive in terms of economic opportunities that will make sure that the center of Chigari is not the only one center in the country that is industrialized and attracting job creations and, and all that. And of course, the, the the other very important destination for investment in the case of Rwanda is services, the sector of services, hotels, uh, hospitality industries, 
and, uh, and banking. Rwanda is positioning itself as a, a regional hub for services, and it's coming, it's coming. When you look at the air transportation, uh, when you look at um, our regional strategic region positioning, what was uh, used to be called as a, a country that is landlocked, Rwanda is becoming landlinked. So through Rwanda, you easily go to East, Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, <coughs> Africa, and Rwanda is a member of, uh, of different regional organizations. You have the COMESA, the Common Market of COMESA for Eastern and Southern Africa, that counts for about 400 million people. That market, because we have a common market, an investment in Rwanda, actually you reach and you invest in Rwanda and you target exports, you have 400 million people or clients, potential clients. We have the East African community, but also on our, on our West, you have another big country. East African community alone, it's about one, 150 million. And with those countries, uh, we, we have these common market arrangements. But also Rwanda is a beneficiary to a, a signatory to Agoa. So if you invest in Rwanda, so you, you can produce your products in, in Africa and, uh, and you get access to an uh, American market. So, but really uh, the emphasis uh, is, is that uh, uh, good governance, without it, the economic development, the investment will be very difficult to, to maintain. Uh, finally, the other thing I wanted to say, um, Rwanda has two other um, identities. One is that uh, in the last 10 years, uh, according to the World Bank Institute, uh, the Doing Business uh, Report, Rwanda is the second best globally, second best reformer in terms of uh, doing business. So we have embraced reforms in terms of doing business that made us one of the top five African nations to be uh, welcoming to have uh, investment climate that is pro-business. The second that goes with that, and it touches uh, an area that is very sensitive in some cases, is accountability and transparency. In that area, actually, in the last 10 years, according to, again, to the World Wide Governance uh, uh, reports, is that Rwanda is the best reformer globally. So there is no other nation on the earth that have has made as much as progress, as much as improvement as Rwanda did in the last 10 years in terms of enforcing accountability, in terms of enforcing transparency, in terms of controlling uh, corruption. And the country uh, has tripled its GDP in the last 15 years or so, and we are looking forward to be one of the middle income countries in the, the next few years. And thanks to that, uh, we, we, we've been able to make it because we innovated our governance and one of the instruments uh, that Peter referred to is our performance contract in Higo. That's a system that makes the government more efficient, that government officials more efficient. And actually as of, as of today, the private sector has embraced that thinking and that's philosophy, it's about uh, the willingness and the commitment to deliver better deliver better quality services. If you have investment people coming, people are committing to serve them the best way they can serve them. So it helps us to, 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 to move forward fast. And actually the private sector also has come up and is, is wanting also to commit because if private sector also works harder and better, it goes without saying that they will be making more money and but also better money because they will be serving uh, uh, good people. So. Uh, Rwanda is, uh, is that country that uh, I referred to before, is uh, given the strategic positioning, given the governance that, uh, good governance we are enjoying, given the transparency that we are instituting, and, and we are very keen on that. And given the internal, domestic, and external security, we have uh, hardly achieved, but we are, we are cherishing very much uh, security. So uh, investing in that, such a country is, uh, is, uh, is as a guarantee for 
healthy business and uh, sustainable uh, profits, if I can say so. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, and now, uh, turn someone whose uh, group of companies has uh, made the plunge and invested uh, in Africa, uh, Ebru. Thank you, Peter, for your kind, uh, kind introduction. Um, and uh, it was very interesting to see, uh, to hear all the nice, good panelists. And actually, we have given a bid in Rwanda before, a couple of years ago, for some cement um, privatization. And I have to admit, it was a very well transparent process. We couldn't win, but we were very happy about the process, and we keep on looking at other options in Rwanda. And I think Rwanda is one of the very important uh, countries in Africa. So as LIMAC, we strongly believe in Africa's significant investment potential. And what we have done so far is we have started three projects at the same time. Actually, we first started in Egypt, but it was just a construction project. We built the Terminal 2 in Cairo, which was a World Bank finance project. It was a very difficult um, time because we started the project when we had the best relations with Egypt. <coughs> And we finalized the project when Turkey and Egyptian relations were not that good. However, we finalized it and then now it's currently under the uh, operation and maintenance period. Afterwards, we, we are one of the second biggest cement produce, we are the second biggest cement producer in Turkey and we started to look at the options of um, cement production in Africa. As uh, Grant also said, I mean, what the la what, what's lacking is infrastructure and we are the infrastructure investors. And to build infrastructure, you definitely need cement. So it's like one of the most important item. And we have realized that um, se the sector is growing like 20% uh, very fast in the African countries. We started the projects in the, the, the first one is Mozambique. And actually in close less than two years, we build the plant, it's active and it's running smoothly right now. So everyone said that, wow, it's a great project. I mean, you've built it very fast. And thanks to, the, uh, thanks to our local partners, uh, the, the government, it's running smoothly and we are very happy about it. The second uh, the plant we are building is in Ivory Coast. It's going a little bit slower as, you know, the governance could be sometimes an issue because to have investors in the country, you really have the to have a good uh, governance, but more than that, you have to have the public <coughs> decision makers to make decisions fast in every levels. So I think when uh, the African countries have more and more private investors, I think this is one of the areas that would definitely develop. But what we believe is if we could, pro if we could make really good projects or s I would say the best practices, if we could create <coughs> best practices in every country, then these will be taken as the examples and will be probably create some good examples for the other American uh, investors, European investors, that we don't see much. And we really would like to have, I think the best would be to have partnerships between maybe Turkish and Europeans or Turkish and Americans. And thanks to Turkish Airlines, of course, which was a big factor, they started to fly everywhere from Istanbul directly and at a very low cost. I mean, compared to the other airlines, I have to say that the, um, the connections plus the prices are really very good. The third option, the third uh, very good opportunity that we got was the airport in <coughs> Senegal. It was half built. It wasn't really uh, moving fast. And then the government invited us with our other Turkish partner. And we took the construction, which was not <coughs> finalized. And we started to build the uh, airport from 70%. The airport will be ready in the third quarter. And what we have done is we built the Sabiha Gökçen Airport here. We had a concession agreement with the Turkish government and we kind of um, <laughs> negotiated with the government. We adapted the same uh, concession agreement to Senegal. And we, the, the only difference is that the government wanted to be a partner in the operation company. We said, <coughs> fine, that's great. I mean, because you will learn to build, uh, how to manage the airports. So what we did is we signed an operations, uh, we signed a concession agreement with this company, which is a, which has a shareholding of two Turkish par uh, companies and the Senegal government, and then we, this this company will operate the airport for 25 years. So basically, I think airports, I think for Africa, 
is, I think, the first very important asset that should be definitely managed by private sector and will create definitely funds for the government budgets. When we uh, when we went into, for example, the Pristina airport in Kosovo, it was a loss-making airport. We built a brand new terminal, and now we are paying to the government. And what we are paying every year is like one of the biggest items in their own budget. So airports, as they are, they have very healthy revenue schemes. They are the best assets, I think, that could be privatized as a, to, to start with. As we have investments, also in energy, we are looking for some energy options, as you know, uh, both uh, my panelists said the same thing. If there's no energy, there's no infrastructure, there's no, uh, it's like this, the, the, the uh, number eight, I mean, number one in the whole thing. So we are one of the biggest energy investors in Turkey, and we are looking for options. And I think Africa has everything. They have the young, young population, great resources, and I think it's time to make now the food ready. So, and for this, you have, Definitely energy is one of the biggest items, and we are ready to uh, invest in energy as well. So as I said before, we are, as a private company, would like to create the best examples that would be examples for the other, con uh, other funds and other private sectors to, uh, to come and invest. <coughs> and currently, uh, we have good experiences all our investments, I could say, that r running very smoothly. I mean, of course we have problems, but in every country we have problems. So the idea is how fast you'll be able to deal with the problems or you can deal with the problems. And on the other hand, we're also long-term investors. So we are seeing the government commitments right now, but we really have to see it in the next 10 to 20 years. So here the sustainability will be also an important topic. So for the moment, that's all I would like to say, and I hope that I can answer questions later. Thank you very much, Ruth, uh, for that uh, statement and your testimony. Mm -hmm. And uh, next, uh, Mustafa, who uh, has the private sector experience of trying to develop bankable deals in West Africa, but now sits on the other side of the table and has the government side of it. So, Mustafa. Thank you, Peter. You know, Peter, what is uh, funny on this panel is that uh, Limac work on the project on which I have been working for a couple of years when I was in Senegal on the airport project. And now that I'm the other side of the table, now I can see all the challenges that we are facing as public servants and to, to encourage uh, private sector investment. Um, as a public servant, the big challenge that we are facing is in Africa is how can we take advantage of the opportunity that we have and how can we ensure that this economic growth is, uh, is shared and it is also inclusive. This is really a big challenge. We have been uh, told and we have been said that we have a lot of opportunities in Africa, but is African are taking advantage of that uh, or those opportunities? That's a big challenge for us as a public servant. Mm -hmm. We would like to ensure that it's shared and everybody uh, uh, got his part on this, uh, on this growth. <coughs> Africa is not... Uh, uh, Mr. Anastas from Rwanda, if I can say from inspiring Rwanda, because Rwanda is inspiring everybody in Africa with their good governance. And uh, Mr. Harris also talked about it. Africa is not an homogeneous entity. The landscape is different, people are different, countries are different, history is different. Uh, type of investment that you can make in Africa are different, whether you are north, south, or east, or west. And the level of development of those countries are not the same. You can have emerging markets in uh, some countries that are more rated as emerging markets. You are, uh, some of them are smaller and less developed, which are uh, uh, stated as uh, frontiers market. And you have many of them which are post-conflict and conflict-affected countries, which we need a lot of also uh, foreign capital. And most of the foreign capital that uh, those countries receive are uh, mainly a focus on uh, resources extraction, so there is no formally transformation, so no value added. You have infrastructure and also uh, servicing uh, foreign, uh, foreign uh, aid presence in the country. So those countries really need, because I would like to really focus uh, my speech on how maybe we can uh, put down the barriers to investment to, uh, to have a more attractive uh, country and continent uh, in whole. So, uh, 
our, our countries need foreign capital, of course, but there is some barriers that uh, discourage sometimes investment, and uh, many African countries are taking uh, some uh, reforms to address those barriers. The barriers are mainly um, are around four. Uh, you have two on the country level and two more on the, on the firm level, which is the private sector itself. So because to encourage the, the private sector uh, development and, and to invest their investment, those barriers should uh, need to be uh, down. I'm, t I'm talking uh, uh, on those points because now I'm the other side of the table. Now I better understand from inside what a uh, private sector can face when it comes to a country in Africa uh, in general. So at the country level, uh, we have sometimes, most of the time, the lack of uh, quasi-public goods, which means uh, the physical infrastructure are not uh, sufficient, such as for transportation, energy, or water. We have also the soft infrastructure, which sometimes we forget. It's the educated workforce. When you like to invest in big uh, industries, then you need to <coughs> have a, a, a well-trained uh, workforce and also uh, the environment. And second, you have um, the political risk. It is, we can talk frankly, sometimes when investors come to Africa, they are afraid of what could happen with their returns. And on the first uh, uh, lack of infrastructure, you can, we, we, are, we have seen for the last 10 years that we are putting in place some regional projects and continental projects through the African Union on the political side, and also the regional thing that even Rwanda and Kenya has implement, are trying to implement a new uh, railway projects. And also in, in Western Africa through ECOWAS, which is an economic zone in, in Africa, and we have some regional projects to address to ensure that those barriers will be uh, uh, put down. For the uh, uh, political risk, uh, we are working on many uh, initiatives and many reforms to uh, enhance our investment climate, as uh, Mr. Anast has uh, said earlier, and also to, to enforce our own capacity as, uh, as a public servants to, uh, to, to speed up the, um, uh, all the transactions when they come in. As uh, Limak was saying, that you need to have uh, a public uh, sector that is uh, uh, proactive and can um, uh, better address the issues that are raised uh, for, the, for the concern. And at the firm level, you have also uh, some kind of <coughs> barriers on which uh, many countries have worked for the last couple of years to address them is mainly on the asymmetric information because the investor doesn't have the same view or and, uh, if he has a partner in the country. So we need to reduce the, the gap between uh, the, the, the way they, they see uh, their investment climate in the country. And the last one is, of course, the transaction cost. To develop a project in Africa, uh, it, might, it might be costly for the, for the investors and also for the entrepreneur, which is in Africa also. And so there's a lot of uh, initiative, a lot of work is being doing uh, to develop communication between uh, uh, such as if there is some uh, commercial mission here in, in Turkey with some uh, uh, entrepreneurs from Africa to come uh, to Turkey or all the, the big summit, political summit that we are seeing right now between Africa and many countries are also uh, uh, helping to reduce those, uh, to put down those barriers for investment. So all the sectors are really uh, uh, diverse depending on where actually you would like to go and the level of which you would like to, to enter and the return that you are expecting. Because we know that uh, investors are not philanthropists, they are businessmen, they would like to make money, but we need to ensure that they will, they will, make, uh, they will make their money and that also Africa will take advantage of, of, their, uh, of, uh, of that. So as a public servant, that's what I stand for and uh, to ensure that, as Peter uh, <coughs> reminded uh, uh, earlier, some big uh, magazine spotted out 10 years ago that Africa was the hopeless continent and it changed its narrative because a lot of work has been done on the public sector to ensure that the investment climate is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is well and that can attract investors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mustafa. And last but not least, uh, uh, for our perspective, especially from our uh, host here in Turkey, Safa. Uh, thank you for giving me this chance to discuss uh, and share our ideas uh, with you. 
uh, today. So actually, I think this is the eighth year of Atlantic Council in Istanbul. I think this one one of the best because because of it is springtime. So springtime is one of the best time to be in Istanbul. So again, uh, I welcome to you all in Istanbul. Uh, briefly, I will give uh, two uh, two ideas, two pillars today of uh, of Turkey's appearance in Africa. So I will briefly give you some information about uh, why Turkey is in Africa, what is the rationale of Turkey to be in sub-Saharan Africa, and secondly, uh, I will try to uh, try to uh, give some some update about uh, energy sector and developments uh, in energy sector towards Africa. And basically, so we can assess Turkey's appearance in Africa in three different periods. So if we, if we uh, assess the first period, so we have to get back to the Ottoman times because uh, Turkey was controlling the Northern Africa uh, more ro uh, northern Africa, but uh, its impact was uh, feeling in the Saharan, uh, today's Saharan countries as well, like Niger, Mali, Chad, uh, Mauritania, Sudan, Ethiopia. So uh, it is because the Ottoman Empire was not the colonial power at those days. So Turkey just, I mean, the Ottoman Empire uh, remained uh, a good reputation in the continent. So what I'm saying is, Turkey's soft power goes back to the Ottoman times. Now, thanks to this kind of power we have today, so we have some, we have some uh, influence in some countries in, in Africa. So the second thing regarding the soft power, which is important, um, what we experience during the 15 years regarding the economy because of the Turkey's is an emerging economy. So uh, some countries in Africa uh, can think that uh, Turkey can be a model country for uh, some sub-Saharan African countries. So uh, we suffer from the instability in the politics regarding the military cues and inflation in economy uh, and high interest rates. So uh, these are like the same for sub-Saharan African Sudanese as well. And also uh, when we come to the second period of Turkey's appearance, Turkey, I mean, uh, in the modern time. So uh, in 1998, Turkish government uh, pronounced that uh, African uh, opening strategy, African action plan. But uh, we couldn't manage to uh, realize this project till 2005. After 2005, the firstly uh, NGOs, uh, civil servants and NGOs and foundations discover, rediscover the Africa again. So the main uh, object and main uh, target was the same, which was the humanitarian. Uh, also state on uh, state actor, which is Tika, Turkish aid, uh, started to grow the sub-Saharan countries as well. So at the end of the day, uh, maybe we uh, are seeing that more than 2,500 wells, for example, uh, uh, finished uh, by Tika and the NGOs. And those NGOs managed to finish some uh, hospitals, schools till today which also created or supported to Turkish appearance in the <coughs> continent as well, because Turks were going there and without asking anything and in return of nothing, they were just doing those projects. That was amazing. And uh, this created a, a unique uh, model. And we say it is as a Turkish model. Uh, if we look at the uh, commercial wise, uh, Turkey is, uh, relatively speaking, a new player in Africa. So we have some limitations in terms of finance, investment, but still we are uh, discovering our opportunities and the limitations and we are expanding them. Uh, for instance, the trade relations is growing up, like you all know. So it was like 
2.7 billion dollar in 2005 now it's it increased more than 9 billion dollar just for sub-saharan africa we if we add northern africa uh, we saw like 20 billion dollar and um in terms of logistics so uh some of my, some of my colleagues uh, just mentioned about the uh, logistic abilities of Turkey, rightly so, like Turkish Airlines. So they are uh, operating more than 40 destinations, and we have uh, 41 embassies in Africa. And the aim is, so we will have uh, like 50, 54 embassies. That means every each country in Africa by, uh, I mean, the embassy, by 2023 so these are these are the creating uh, the logistic uh, advantage as well for turkish entrepreneurs so thanks to turkish airlines and there are a lot of business delegations keep coming and going to every corner of africa nowadays uh, if you look at the energy sector side to the picture so we can uh, justify of Turkey's appearance in Africa as saying Turkey is an energy dependent country as you all know so the the important thing is uh, by reaching the African resources which is the benefit for Turkish side uh, as you can expect uh, it would be great actually because I mean the uh, if you are uh, giving some information about the natural uh, national uh, energy uh, strategy we are trying to use our uh, local resources more than uh, the resources coming from abroad and uh, in that wise sub-saharan africa is over there and we are trying to we are trying to uh, still discover the uh, my uh, minerals and the hydrocarbons and we are um, is signing MOUs with the countries. So far, uh, we have more than 20 uh, MOUs with 20 different countries, and we are still looking at the other opportunities. But the thing is, the most important thing that is, I think, the business model. So um, we have, like I said, uh, have s we have some opportunities in in the continent, but. Uh, also, we have a good reputation companies, EPC companies, throughout the world. And thanks to these companies, and you know the story uh, more than me, uh, we can provide the EPC companies, and uh, we are looking for the uh, possible cooperation with the other countries as well. So that is why uh, our Exim Bank, uh, sign and co-finance agreement with some other countries in Europe and the United States as well. So thanks to these kind of uh, cooperation opportunities, uh, we will be bringing the EPC companies to the to the table, and uh, <coughs> we will have co-finance, for example, from the United States Aid, United, sorry, United States Import and Exim Bank. And uh, on the other hand, at the end of the day, uh, our African uh, friends uh, will be reaching the electrification, for example. Uh, so when we are when we are focusing to to reach the, for example, for instance, the uh, hydrocarbons or or so, so at the uh, another side, so. Uh, Needless to say, it's a big problem, electrification for the Africans. The lacking of electricity is, uh, is such a problem for every corner of the country, continent. So in this regard, uh, we are on the way to develop the uh, business model. <laughs> and uh, we, are looking for, we are looking for the uh, any opportunities uh, coming from the uh, other counterparts uh, and uh, and and also uh, I can say uh, Turkey uh, trying to have a unique uh, 
position in the continent at the end of the day. And I think uh, at this stage, thank you. Thank you very much for giving us uh, that perspective and rounding off our, our discussion. Uh, I would like to open it up to the floor and uh, in the interests of time and giving others, uh, if you would keep your uh, question uh, short and maybe we'll take t uh, two or three and then open it up to uh, those on the panel who'd like to raise a question. Aubrey. Thank you, Peter. Um, my question is for um, Abru and Mustafa and Safa. <coughs> Um, what are the measures do you think that uh, need to be in place to encourage more, more Turkish companies to go? Uh, we understand that the logistical uh, infrastructure is there now. Uh, we understand that there's a political interest because the president has gone on several state missions. But as I've talked to Turkish companies, they're always looking for an infrastructure project, a large infrastructure project with a sound sense of financing. And if they don't hear one of those, then they just stay on the sidelines, in my senses. Yet, Turkey has so much to offer in terms of the experience it's gone through as a developing country. So what are the three things you think could be uh, more encouraging for companies, whether it's Turkish XM or something of that sort? Uh, just a, a shout out. Aubrey is one of our senior fellows at the Atlanta Council's Africa Center, but she also uh, works in uh, helping companies do business in Africa and over years uh, uh, of our association, I think, what's your number at? Two billion now or in investments in Africa. So uh, someone to talk to. M Michael? Uh. Thanks. Um, <coughs> well, I'm Michael Saul. Uh, I'd like uh, to ask a question to Mr. Shiaka. Um, well, I work at the President's Delivery Unit and one of the big reforms we are working on is the public sector reform. Um, I'm actually in the process of drafting uh, some uh, government performance contracts because we're trying to embark on that experiment too. Um, basically, I mean, uh, what we're trying to do with this reform is improve governance, improve the quality of services, uh, improve equity, s uh, social and territorial equity, uh, as well as uh, modernize uh, administrative processes but one of the big problems <coughs> we're facing is implementation uh, for different reasons. Obviously, there's uh, often a lack of political will on some certain aspects of the reform. There's, uh, we're, we're having difficulties of getting the stakeholders to take ownership of the reforms. There's a problem with accountability uh, from the stakeholders, and there's a big resistance to change. So could you please share with us, like, uh, some of the experiences that you, you put in place in Rwanda to uh, uh, get around some of the problems I just mentioned. Thank you. Maybe uh, to uh, start with that la uh, last question, Professor Chaka, and then re reverse it uh, to Aubrey's question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the question is, uh, is question which is very good um, very briefly I think reform especially reform for the uh, public sector is a, is a is a political destination and is a political statement so leadership is going to be key if you want to drive reform and make it a success and leadership is not just one man one man show it is about uh, the whole government does the government have the same purpose if, if yes then they could be able to embrace it. But even if it is a political statement, uh, sometimes technical approaches uh, uh, come in and help. So maybe I can share with you what have we done, especially uh, Rwanda Governance Board has been uh, uh, spearheading such initiatives that helped the <coughs> government to be more effi effect effective. One of the approaches we took, uh, as I we explained before, was the Imihigo performance contract. But actually, we made them measurable. As the statisticians say that if, if you want to improve, you have to measure it. So in other words, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So we started uh, measuring, measuring public sector, measuring, uh, involving the citizens also in, measure, in measurements, those measurements that 
creating scorecards. We've created a scorecard for the local government to make districts more accountable to the people, but also to make the sectors also accountable to the people. So in such a way that you can see uh, the most performing district can be seen through those kind of scorecards. Mm -hmm. And the least performing will be in red. It's a kind of name and shame. Mm -hmm. So, so it, is, it is an incentive in terms of working. Uh, second, uh, it is also a kind of uh, policy reform driven from the evidence. So actually when we do applied research in public sector, in delivery, so you can see where you lack uh, and what you lack and where you have uh, weaknesses and then political uh, decision makers will have <coughs> evidence to, to be able to make some choices. And number three, um, we accountability is uh, must be uh, enforced, otherwise uh, uh, the system might might suffer very much. So accountability starting from, from within and from where the decisions are, are being made. So Rwanda has, has tried to deploy those kind of elements, uh, combining uh, homegrown innovations, uh, another thing, accountability summit, we have what we call the national leadership retreat, whereby the government commits to a number of projects per year and uh, when time comes, it's once a year and, and uh, reporting to that and failing to, to delivery can cost uh, a lot to public servants. So we, uh, we have tried to put together all those uh, cultural infrastructure, you know, governance innovations, but also uh, uh, governance efficiency and leadership drive uh, to make sure that transformation can, can, can come through. Lastly, um, another point that have made uh, our, our choices probably comfortable, uh, Rwanda, we, we've come up to realize that governance of aid is actu actually much more complicated than governance of trade and investment. So uh, because of that, the focus in our policy reforms and all that we have encouraged our own, ourselves and our, our, our system to be much more uh, oriented to governing trade and investment, to attracting investment. Uh, aid is, need, aid is, ne is needed, but um, uh, going forward is not very much sustainable. And also taking into consideration the current global challenges that uh, we know all of them, whether you talk about uh, the West or the new emerging markets, uh, something called aid is not coming so easily, but investment is kind of win-win solution. So moving into win-win <coughs> solutions uh, uh, have helped. And uh, finally, um, we've took our citizens uh, as the owners of any public projects. So, and, and they, 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 they became the emanes officers, they become the parliament when, when it is required because, so they become the enforcers and they become the ones that uh, are actually guiding whatever choice we are taking. Thank you. To, uh, Aubrey's question on investments, or do you want to leave it off? Okay, okay. okay. Thank, thanks for the question. And um, I actually identified more than three. I don't know if it will help. <laughs> so, um, so you're right. I mean, Exim Banks is definitely a good force. It's if you have the Exim Bank, it's great to start a project and if you can combine this with a multilateral and maybe if you can end up some little local content, or some bank or some so forth, it will be a really a good project and you can risk your equity. But I mean, the main issue could be, like Sefa Bey said, you have to have a business plan. I mean, and to create a business plan or a feasibility, it requires time and money. If, if a TDA, like, you know, trade development agency kind of structure is established for Africa, I don't know, maybe a pilot project, and if, if, it, if it can help to the companies to develop feasibilities and show a, like a best practice feasibility, then it could also help because you really need time and there's always opportunity costs. Should I invest here or there or in another country or another continent? So, and it requires, as I said, money and time. So if, and this, this kind of an organi organization might help. The third one is a local partner. I mean, reliable local partners in the countries that we do business is a must for us. Where whichever country we go, we really would like to have somebody local. And this is what we also recommend for the international 
uh, companies to do business in Turkey, get a you know, local partner for you to be more um, active in Turkey. So v uh, good local partners, meaning that some little small to medium-sized uh, um, companies should emerge from Africa, these countries as well. The other one would be the risk sharing. I mean, Turkish companies and the Turkish people are really entrepreneurs. They go to countries. And if you could combine this, this is what we are talking to some European and American companies who has no house, like an energy plant. I mean, we are the entrepreneurs. We can go and start the business. But these American, European companies can bring their know-how, the plants, the experience, and then we can combine these plus a local partner. And on top of it, if we can put this on a PPP and put the government in the business, it will even be better. So basically all these things, you know, they come together or one or two, or you know, you can combine them all. But um, this could be- Follow up there. Does, does Turkish XM currently have those programs? And do you have a TDA? Do you have a TDA we facility don't have a TDA. right now? No, okay. no, no. I mean, uh, Sefa Bey said that, I mean, I think this, the business plan is the must to do business. I, I like the TDA appro approach of American government. So if this could be created. And the, the, the uh, final one could be like a one shop, you know, like an organization which would help the foreign investors to do business in the countries because the challenge might be sometimes that you have to deal with um, this organization, that organization, that ministry, this, that, and then even the notary, it might create issues. So this could be also another approach. Thank you very much. It is uh, f always funny to, to, to listen to somebody from the private sector, you know, <laughs> all the challenges they are facing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Every, everything at the same time. <laughs> yes. I think uh, <coughs> to just maybe focus on how uh, Turkey can uh, seize more and better opportunities in Africa and your question about the large scale projects that some uh, Turkish company are looking for. Uh, earlier I have mentioned that uh, Africa is organized, is not a an homogeneous entity, but is organized <laughs> through the African Union with some uh, uh, regional economic uh, uh, communities where you also have regional projects. Uh, for example, uh, Mali uh, in my country is uh, within the uh, uh, West African Economic and Monetary uh, Union where we share the same uh, currency, uh, we have the same economic zone, and we also have some regional projects. Two years ago, that zone uh, made, made a, uh, an uh, investment promotion activity in Dubai where we actually uh, put all our regional projects to, to, to attract uh, because we know that sometimes some investors need uh, large-scale projects, 500 million, billion, uh, a couple of billion of, of dollars or euros of projects. And uh, as Wanda did with Kenya and uh, uh, Namibia, I think, uh, Mr. Shiaka, the the railway project in Rwanda, it's with Kenya and uh, Uganda. And Uganda, and Uganda. So uh, those are large scale projects. And I think with all the um, uh, continental summit that Africa is having with many countries and Turkey also, those regional projects could be uh, proposed to uh, tur tur Turkish investors. And uh, because some country itself sometimes the market is small, too small, so we, it's not enough uh, for us uh, investor to go there. Thank you. Um, <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, to me, I think for a company, the the main uh, target of the company uh, to do a business or a project in in somewhere such as Africa. So let's say minimizing the risk, right? So there are some dimensions of it. For example, finance-wise and the uh, political risk management. So if you look at the finance, so I just mentioned the Turkish Exim, but if you look at the Exim banks in the world, so you can see that they have their own limitations. That explains why China and how and why China is successful in Sub-Saharan. And uh, we have to we have to create a unique finance model. Maybe just for Turkey now. I mean, the, we are looking for and considering and working hard to, to develop an uh, Africa investment fund, for instance. 
uh, but Turkey has their uh, limitations as well. But uh, but at least this is something. <coughs> this is something because this is the uh, exploration uh, period, still exploration for 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 the Turkish entrepreneurs. So that is why maybe it can be an uh, answer for the finance wise. If we look at the political risk management, so maybe we should focus to PPP models for the Turkish consortiums. So maybe we will be providing the Turkish state-owned companies to the consortium in order to uh, minimize the uh, political risk in the eye of the Turkish entrepreneurs or so, or the other third parties. Uh, like I said, uh, Turkey will bring the, I mean, the Turkish enterprise will bring the uh, construction power and we will have the equipment from the another country by having the finance and it would be the, it would be the maybe model, uh, a unique PPP model maybe or so. So uh, these are the, these are the things that I can say. Another thing is the legal wise, uh, I, I haven't mentioned it. Uh, yes, uh, when you look at the business model, there are two dimensions, finance and legal wise. So companies always wants to see the uh, proper uh, sustainable uh, regulations in the countries. Uh, so I think this is, the, this is another thing to, uh, to have a, a kind of essential for doing a project and finishing the project in a country. Uh, in that wise, uh, yes, uh, Turkish ent entrepreneurs uh, have a lot of uh, uh, responsibility in the continent uh, because we are focusing more about by starting from Somalia till Guinea. And there are a lot, lot of countries there, mainly uh, landlocked countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, to be honest, uh, it is just not easy to reach there and uh, finishing the projects. Well, thank you very much for that. I'm sorry we're, we've run out of time and the, uh, the next session begins very shortly, but this conversation can certainly continue uh, outside. The plenary session on uh, regional transcontinental energy markets uh, interconnections will be in this room, and the strategy se session on regional security outlook will be in the uh, New Chatel room. Uh, reminder, housekeeping, Reminder, please remember to wear your credentials at all times and be sure to download uh, our app at AC Summit for the latest updates. Uh, so please join me now in thanking our distinguished panelists.